Uh, hello, Berlin. Good morning, uh, Foss Backstage. Uh, happy to be here talking to you about science today. I uh, hope you're excited about science as well. Um, if I've done my job by the end of the presentation, you will be, so uh, we'll see how we do. Um, I should start this presentation by noting that uh, I submitted this talk when CoreOS was CoreOS, but now CoreOS is Red Hat. So uh, I am technically part of the Red Hat family and representing them, but uh, I figured I would keep my slide deck and CoreOS themes still, uh, you know, for old time's sake. So uh, my talk today is about uh, the contrast between the early days of medicine and uh, how we make software today. Uh, you know, in the old days, at least as they tell it in the American tales of the West, uh, there were a lot of folks wandering around uh, pulling teeth and putting leeches on people, um, using somewhat sort of barbaric means of uh, administering medicine. But uh, this is what they knew and a lot of what uh, was taught to them, was passed around by folk knowledge or um, just face-to-face, -face, people telling stories about what they think worked. Um, sometimes it did work, sometimes it didn't. Uh, and eventually we got to today where medicine is highly science-based. Um, and I think there's an interesting parallel between that journey and the journey um, we're making uh, with software today. So um, I got interested in this originally because uh, working at CoreOS with the smart folks there, we make a number of open source projects. So uh, I became interested in measuring our project's health, uh, trying to figure out if uh, things were going well, if they were going poorly, um, how to kind of get early signals as to you know whether uh, one or the other is happening, and uh, sort of figuring out uh, what are the important measures to look for to uh, figure those things out. So I started writing uh, Google Big Queries to uh, you know, uh, piece some of that information together. And like most people, I started looking at a uh, number of commits per week and source lines of code. But uh, you know, as, as you are probably aware, those are unsatisfying metrics to work by. Um, as a developer, you don't feel like those accurately capture uh, all of the complexity that goes into making software. So I thought there must be something better. Um, and uh, indeed there was. So uh, just to uh, fully draw this parallel out, um, the world of medicine uh, not too long ago went through a similar sort of process. So uh, it wasn't so long ago in say the 1850s that a Hungarian doctor actually discovered uh, that if doctors washed their hands, they could greatly decrease the mortality rate of women giving birth. Uh, what he noticed is that uh, doctors who performed autopsies uh, would then go and deliver children for uh, women who were in labor. And the women who had doctors do that versus the women who had uh, midwives do that uh, had starkly different outcomes. Uh, and it turns out it's because the midwives never actually got their hands dirty with uh, diseased bodies doing autopsies. So um, he devised a little experiment and had some doctors wash their hands with chlorine after they uh, did the work with cadavers uh, and found this dramatically reduced the mortality rate for uh, women giving birth. Um, despite the evidence, uh, it still took years for uh, these findings to catch on. Um, and I, I found we're sort of in a similar place with software where uh, we've done a lot of interesting research on things beyond just uh, whether to use bubble sort or quick sort. Um, that stuff is very scientific in computer science, but uh, when it comes to the day-to-day -day operations of writing software, um, actually making things, uh, we still rely on a lot of mysticism. So. Uh, you know, we, we talk about things like 10x programmers and Conway's Law and a lot of other of these things that uh, are passed around similarly to leeches and uh, teeth pulling of the olden days. Um, we do it because we think they're right, uh, but that's all we have is we think they're right for the most part. So uh, I started to think like, has someone actually tested this? Can someone tell me uh, whether this actually is right? Um, and it turns out for more than a decade, uh, this book has uh, been out um, almost, uh, you know, we're, we're about two years shy, I guess. Uh, so uh, I guess my math's slightly uh, off by two, maybe not off by one, um, but yeah. Uh, in any event, this, this book 
I found really enlightening. It took a lot of actual empirical studies about the, the, uh, the process of making software um, and talked about them. Things like Conway's Law, the 10X Engineer, and those things. So um, that's what we're going to dive into next here. Cool. So uh, this is sort of serendipitous in that there are open source cupcakes in the next room, I believe. So uh, I didn't plan this with this slide, but uh, this is one of the, the I think, most fun things I discovered uh, doing this research is, I guess, in Silicon Valley, at least, people like to talk about the need to hire the best developers. Uh, you know, when you commit something to an API, people start consuming that API. It sort of gets stuck in that place. Uh, and everybody has to live with your poor decisions for decades. So um, it's paramount that you have the best programmers you possibly can. Um, and part of that mythology uh, relies on a study that was done um, comparing sort of the spectrum of programming talent. Uh, what is the gap of skill between the best and the absolute worst programmer? Um, well, the study that was originally done that uh, most people are citing but don't uh, actually realize was a study that was done on a college campus. Um, and it was done with uh, computers when they were still doing programming through punch cards. Um, so starkly different than how we write software today. Uh, and in this study, they were actually um, measuring people who had basically almost no knowledge of computers whatsoever. So the equivalent of uh, a parent or a relative who uh, needs you to do everything, including log them into their email for them. Um, and people who'd been programming for years. So, um, you know, people who were doing programming in a professional capacity. Uh, and in that study, uh, they found that there was actually a 68x difference between the absolute worst and the absolute best uh, when it came to the output that they were able to put out in the test there. Uh, this isn't too enlightening, it turns out. <laughs> uh, in most cases, you're not hiring people to work with you and your team off the street that uh, are the equivalent of someone who barely knows how to access their email. You're, you're hiring people who uh, studied programming or uh, have some capacity for programming. And uh, in a 2000 study, uh, they found that in most workplaces where people are actually programming, I think it was across uh, more than 100 developers, or 100 code bases, 1,000 developers, um, they, they found that uh, the gap was more like a 3x gap between the best and the worst programmer in the office. And when you started to control for things like uh, the amount of domain expertise and the amount of years on the job, um, that gap uh, starts to rapidly shrink. So uh, the idea that there's one programmer in your team who's absolutely indispensable and they know everything and um, you can't live without them because they're a 10x programmer uh, is sort of a mythology that I think we need to let go as programmers. Cool. Um, the next most uh, interesting thing I learned was about uh, Conway's Law. So uh, if you're unfamiliar, Conway's Law is the idea that uh, code reflects team structure. So uh, the canonical example for Conway's Law is if you have a team, or say you have four teams, and you're writing a compiler, you'll get a four-pass compiler. Uh, so the idea is that the organization of your company is directly reflect reflected on your repository. Um, this gets cited commonly, but uh, you know the question is open, has it been proved? Uh, and the answer is yes. There was a uh, 2006 study uh, by Cataldo. Um, I'm probably mispronouncing that name, but if you check the uh, slides, there's, there's links to this research. Um, who looked at this and he found that uh, Conway's law is actually real, um, and it's really real. Uh, it's real enough that they found that organizational factors were a better predictor of uh, how the code turned out than things like the actual code. So if you looked at cyclomatic complexity uh, or uh, did code analysis um, using static analysis type tools, uh, the organization of team structure was actually better uh, in terms of figuring out uh, how the code would turn out architecturally uh, than those other things. So um, I think that's quite interesting. Uh, similarly, there was another study that happened um, in the same sort of time period uh, that 
kind of looked at the difference between open source projects and closed source projects. So uh, this is sort of the idea of the cathedral and the bazaar. Um, the, the dream is that for most open source projects, uh, they act like a bazaar where uh, program programmers can come to your stall, converse with you, drop something off, uh, you give them something in return, and then they go to another stall, um, and they're sort of self-guided. Um, if you've actually contributed to open source, uh, at least in my experience, um, this is not true. Uh, and uh, this study that I, I read uh, in this book sort of compared uh, the Linux code base to the Microsoft code base for Windows um, amongst uh, a few other projects. And they found uh, when they looked at a graph of how the governance model of those uh, programs were set up, um, Linux is actually pretty hierarchical. Uh, you have Linus on top. He has his lieutenants under him. He literally calls them lieutenants. Um, and they each own certain areas of the program. Um, and you may be aware that it's actually relatively hard to do drive-by commits in open source generally. Um, some commits are helpful, and uh, you know, contributors are happy to take patches. Uh, but some commits are someone essentially just backing a dump truck up to your code base, dumping a bunch of code, and saying, you maintain this for me now? All right, I'm out. Peace. Uh, and that's usually not very friendly. Um, it's usually not the sort of thing that uh, people appreciate too much. Uh, usually when you're contributing to uh, code, uh, people tend to collaborate on teams naturally, and they tend to stick with those teams if they are a good contributor. Um, and this happens naturally in open source projects. And projects that are particularly good at this today are projects like Rust. If you've ever contributed to Rust, you know what I'm talking about. Um, they have a lot of bots and other things that introduce you to people who have worked on similar areas of the code that you've worked on, um, kind of guiding you through the process of getting integrated with their sort of norms and values. Um, and uh, the, the other thing uh, is Kubernetes is also very good at this. Kubernetes tends to orient itself around SIG groups, uh, special interest groups for various areas of the code base. Um, and you can exploit Conway's law uh, by just knowing that um, people are going to work better on teams naturally. So if you want good contrib contribution model for your project, um, find a way to integrate new contributors into teams and that will lead to happier, uh, longer-term contributions to the work that you're doing. Uh, this is sort of my takeaway, unscientific as it is, but uh, if you were around yesterday, there was a talk on empathy in software, um, and this is why that sort of stuff is so important. Um, turns out software is made of people, uh, is the way I like to think of Conway's law, um, which means all of the messy, ugly things we have to deal with as people uh, affect the code that we're deploying. So um, figuring out how to work well in a team uh, actually turns out to be relatively important. Cool. Uh, next question. Uh, does pair programming work? Um, so I'm going to go a little bit faster through these because it looks like I'm uh, running a little low on time. Um, but pair programming is great when uh, the problem is complex, uh, errors in the code are costly, uh, and the knowledge transfer lowers the bus factor on your team. So the bus factor is the idea if uh, someone gets hit by a bus tomorrow, uh, you know, your team can still function. They don't have everything sitting inside their head uh, that nobody else knows. Um, a study of pair programming uh, found that pair programming is actually best when different personalities pair. Um, it's sort of uh, interesting. It's not something you would uh, think would be true, but when an extrovert and an introvert pair together, um, that tends to be the best combination for doing pair programming for whatever reason. Um, they're not really sure. Um, they found that pairing reduces interruptions when you're coding, which I know we all uh, suffer from and uh, dislike by the number of memes I see floating around on Twitter and Reddit. Um, so uh, the thought uh, here is also that uh, they don't actually know why this is, but they think it's if someone sees a group of people doing something, they're much less likely to interject and ask them to help them or uh, distract them. They see they're busy uh, collaborating. Um, so they'll go along their merry way unless it's truly important. Um, and uh, the final thing is pair programming isn't something you can just do randomly uh, and have it work. Uh, people have to actually train to do pair programming correctly together. So you need at least 12 hours of training generally um, before you become proficient and you start to see benefits of pair programming. 
Um, so uh, some devs, maybe one in 20, uh, they found will just never pair well at all. That's fine. Um, pair programming tends to work faster, since it's, but since it's two coders, um, it ultimately uh, ends up costing you about 15% more developer hours. Uh, and the ideal session is, you know, four hours maximum. Um, if you go longer than four hours in a day, you're going to get diminishing returns on this. Cool. So who's, who's ever tried to measure code by source lines of code or commits or churn, um, anything like that? Has anyone ever made that? Yeah. I, I, I have, uh, I think we all have when we first uh, start looking into this stuff and we all sort of immediately realize that um, it's actually pretty difficult to quantify uh, the value of code. So um, there are some scientific measures for doing this. Uh, there's McCabe's cyclomatic complexity, um, which I'll just jump through really quickly. Uh, there's Halstad's uh, software science metrics. It looks at operators uh, and uh, determines complexity based off of that. Um, and then there's simpler measures. There's things like source lines of code and number of functions. So uh, one study found, uh, when you look at all of these together uh, and how they correlate in terms of uh, telling you things about the quality or the hygiene of the code, um, a value of one, if you pair these together, uh, means they are perfectly correlated. So if you look at uh, source lines of code in the top row here, and you go over to uh, HL Eng and H volume, uh, basically, those are the Halstead complexity metrics that are sort of the intuitive way to measure complexity. Um, and source lines of code has a 97% overlap with that in terms of correlation, uh, telling you whether your code is good or not, uh, which seems crazy to me. Like, I would never expect that result, uh, but that's how science works. Um, so uh, there is some healthy skepticism you should have here. Uh, this study was done on C files, so this may not apply to your programming language of choice. Uh, science needs to do more work to sort of figure that out. And they found for small files, less than 100 lines of source code, um, this also tends to fall away as well when you're, you're measuring complexity uh, and likelihood of bugs in your code. Um, so uh, all of this research is pulled from this uh, wonderful book, Making Software, What uh, Really Works and Why We Believe It. Uh, this is a fantastic book. Um, I should just add one caveat, and that is that science uh, is uh, never derived from a single study. A single study never proves anything. It's derived from the community opinions uh, over that are derived from multiple studies. Uh, and it's the community that is objective, and all of us, because we are passionate people, uh, are ultimately subjective no matter how much we try. Um, these are uh, interesting resources that I'll just uh, sort of jump through because I'm low on time. Uh, there's also the Chaos Project, uh, which is uh, community metrics that are being uh, run through by the Linux Foundation for measuring your own software projects. Uh, this is very early, so if this is something that interests you, this is a great group to get involved with. Um, and uh, I'll end by just saying that uh, it's a little more complex than just adding more science to what you're doing because uh, science generally has a limited view of the world. There are things that science understands and things that science doesn't. Um, and if you were to only act upon science, you would have a very limited range of action in what you do day to day. Uh, so it's good to be scientifically minded, but you have to get work done nonetheless. Um, so if you say, uh, this theory that we work from is broken and incomplete and it's terrible, your boss may say, yes, it's broken and incomplete and terrible, get back to work. Um, and that's fine. Um, all the same, uh, I think it's relatively important to uh, raise those object objections and when other people raise the objections to be supportive. Um, an uh, interesting example of this not happening was when Einstein went to publish his theory of general relativity. Uh, Max Planck uh, got an early review copy because he was a huge advocate for Einstein's first uh, like kind of groundbreaking paper. Um, and Max Planck uh, wrote back and said, in the first place, you won't succeed, and even if you do, no one will believe you, which is wild considering how impactful uh, the theory of general relativity ended up being. Um, so we should all be a little bit supportive of the crazy ideas our coworkers um, have. Uh, it's possible to be both supportive and skeptical. 
Um, and that talk on empathy yesterday, uh, I, th I think, had some good points on how to do that. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, the process of science. Uh, this is an unscientific thought, but uh, I like to believe it's about being agitated about the models that we build and use. So um, you look at all good science, it ends up getting overturned or proven wrong by the generation that comes next. So uh, you look at uh, people like uh, early psychologists, uh, Eric Erickson and Carl Jung, uh, both studied under Freud uh, and both just totally tore apart Freud's theories. Came up with their own, were way more accurate, way more well received. Um, that doesn't mean what Freud did wasn't worthwhile. Um, it was just an incomplete model. And most science is working from incomplete models, uh, but we are able to progress because we get agitated by those incomplete models. So um, if there's one recommendation for sort of pushing our industry forward, uh, it's that we should uh, continue to agitate. We should remind ourselves when we're working on knowledge that uh, is not scientific and incomplete, and we should remind those around us that that is happening as well. Uh, and maybe one day uh, that theory will get tested or someone will do some reading like uh, making software and uh, bring that into the office and bring some science into your life. Um, so before I end this, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to my friend uh, Diane Thompson, who is a scientist herself. Um, and conversations with her helped me uh, to formulate uh, some of the thoughts behind this talk. Um, and she's also getting married this weekend in Sweden. So uh, to Diane, um, to you and Marcus, I wish you happiness and health. Thank you.